Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Tuesday, January 24th, episode two, day two of Pitcher Week. We continue with starting pitchers, picking up where we left off on our Monday episode. So if you're looking for pitchers going inside the top 100 overall, it's the episode right before this one. Today, we have about 35 pitchers on the rundown. So we are going to try and get things moving as quickly as we can. And just as we did yesterday, we're going to break players into clusters, basically half tiers because the difference between the pitcher at pick 100 and even pick 150 or 160 is actually pretty small but we're talking about guys who often are grouped together within the same couple of rounds that's an easier way for us to look at it easier way to problem solve what you are going to do on draft day Uh, before we dive in a quick disclaimer Shohei Otani will be discussed in full in the utility episode. We didn't talk about him on day one of pitchers. He obviously is a day one caliber pitcher in leagues where he's a pitcher only, but the Otani discussion is forthcoming because there are so many different ways that leagues allow you to utilize his stats. So he's kind of in his own conversation. Now, you know, we begin where we picked up last, last time, a lot of Mariners pitchers. Wait, should we do the news real quick? Well, we can talk about it real quick. Sure. Yeah. Well, well, it's just it's little news. Uh, I mean, it's little news in real baseball. It could be big news in fantasy baseball. Uh, breaking news. We've got Adalberto Mondesi joining the Red Sox from Boston. <laughs> Going the other way is lefty reliever Josh Taylor, who spent all of last year on the IL. So uh, that's a clue that it's not a real big baseball decision. Um, but the Red Sox, I don't know that Christian Arroyo or Mika Hernandez is a good defensive shortstop at this point. And really what they needed was a defensive shortstop. And I think this team goes better if Enrique is the starter at second, Ana Berto is the starter at short, and Christian Arroyo is a backup. I just think that's a better situation for this team. And so uh, good trade for the Red Sox. Uh, I think there's all the time that you can, all the uh, playing time that Alberto Mondesi can get is there within reach, at least for the first couple of months, depending on his health, which is awful. And he's not a very good bat. So he's going to drag down all of your non steals situations, but that is more steals in the market. I believe, you know, that is another Jorge Mateo type uh, as I think I have to give uh, you the copyright on that, uh, that uh, another Jorge Mateo type late in the draft, a uh, not great hitter that will steal bases if uh, the stars align. Yeah, I mean, the plate skills are pretty similar. The tools are, are very similar defensively. I think Mondesi can at least be a good shortstop. Uh, Mondesi might have more power. Yep, a little more. Um, but as far as what I would project, what I would expect, it's not that much more. Mateo popped 13 homers last year, so if you give Mondesi close to a full season's worth of plate appearances, you're probably looking at high teens. That'd be the difference, but I think stolen base output similar, slash line expectations very similar as well. It's just going to come down to health. This is a great lottery ticket for a team that was just... That's what I'm saying. This is this is worth. Yeah, this is they're worth a high the variance team in that in that their rotation, if it works out, actually could be good. If it doesn't work out, it could be bad. So they're a high variance team. They got a high variance shortstop. Yeah, I'd like, and it didn't cost them much. Yep, more to come on Mondesi on the shortstop preview in uh, about a week, week and a half or so. I think that's about when that one is going to. If we waited, we would have discussed Elvis Andrews as a Red Sox. <laughs> yeah, I know. We probably <laughs> probably could have. Uh, yeah, they could still do that. It's not, not bad to have two guys that can play the position on the roster, given uh, how we usually like to build teams. But let's get to the pitching. Three Mariners right in a row, right after pick 100. I don't really understand why exactly, but Robbie Ray, George Kirby, Logan Gilbert, all right there in this range. This is a great group of pitchers. You got Hunter Green. Behind that trio, Luis Severino sitting in this range just after pick 100. His teammate, Nestor Cortez. We got Logan Webb. We got Kyle Wright coming off a big season. We got Blake Snell showing some interesting skills a year ago. Clayton Kershaw still very good on a per inning basis. And Nick Lodolo. And I think this spans about 40 picks from pick 100 to pick 140. Let's start with the early part of this list. And the simple question is you look at this cluster. Who stands out? Who do you move up? Who do you feel like is a priority for you to draft in this range? We're talking round seven, round eight, where a lot of people are looking for that second, possibly their third starting pitcher. 
is, uh, I, I would say Hunter Green. Hunter Green is my favorite guy here just because he's way, uh, way ahead of everybody else on stuff. Plus, we're going into a season that's going to uh, uh, care about uh, suppressing balls in play. You want strikeouts if there's not as much shift behind you. Um, and he's got a real opportunity uh, to uh, just, you know, kind of Spencer Strider it, you know, just come out of nowhere and, uh, and, and outstuff everybody. The command got a little bit better. Some of the decisions in terms of his pitch mix, I think, got a little bit better uh, over the course of the season. And uh, the only other name that really jumps off, there's two other names that jump off. I actually want to throw in this little mini tier, uh, Luis Severino. Uh, who does have, uh, according to uh, Jeff Zimmerman's injury numbers, a as high a uh, injury number as you might expect. Uh, he's a 99.6. Is that, no, that's the ADP. No, that's injury percentile. 99.6 percentile. I think. I don't know if I've seen a higher one. So he's he's at the very very top of the injury. Uh, risk uh, board at the same time uh, you know the stuff was good last year the command was good and the opportunities there and then Blake Snell man uh, after he stopped throwing that change up uh, he really took off he's he's commanding things better I know he doesn't pitch a lot uh, of innings but I think by the time you get down to this place uh, you're not expecting a lot of innings. I, I, I know that you can look both ways at the fact that there's like two 200 inning guys anymore, and the most you can really expect from your uh, ace is 180 innings. But the way I look at that is if the most I can expect is 180 and we're now looking at 140s, I'm not going to not take a guy here because he might only throw 140. If those are 140 good innings, I'm in. Yeah, I, I think – Throughout the pitching pool, you also have to remember, as long as you're not saddled with a bunch of pitchers who are injured at the same time or being uh, nursed away from a, a high innings total at the same time, which would be younger guys, usually around the all-star break and late in the year. There's a couple times a year where teams like to really uh, take some some of the workload away. As long as you don't have too many guys like that, you get a replacement. Your roster is flexible enough where you get the good innings from the guy that you really like as your SP one or two or three, and then you get the back bill from your depth, right? So it's not just like, Oh, he's out. So I'm screwed. It's like, it's hard to manage it, but you can, you can take on some of this risk. Everyone has to take on some of this risk. I think Snell versus Severino from a, who do you really think throws more innings perspective is pretty fun. And I think the other thing that's interesting to point out with a pitcher like Luis Severino, who's now in his late 20s, and he started to really add to that pitch mix. Deeper arsenal than when we saw him earlier in his career have a lot of success back in 17 and 18. Even though the projections come in in the 140 range when you look at his fan graphs page, the ceiling compared to the young starters who get projected for 140 is more like that 180. Like there's, there's no reason other than getting hurt why the Yankees won't just let Luis, Luis Severino throw as many innings as he can. They're just going to let him pitch, right? This is a guy who's in the last year of his contract. It's a walk year for him. So if they feel like he's going six innings consistently and he can give them 30 starts, he can get to 180 innings. A lot of guys projected for 140 can't go to 180 because they will be capped somewhere before that, whether that's even a little over 140 or not over 140 at all. So I do think I like taking shots on this type of pitcher. Yes, the injury risk is there, but I probably didn't take on a lot of injury risk with my first couple pitchers. If I drafted DeGrom, I'm probably not putting Severino behind DeGrom, right? You have to think about who you're putting together as far as your cumulative risk with your staff. Yeah, and I can see why by ADP, Robbie Ray, George Kirby, and Logan Gilbert are ahead of uh, the people that we love so much for their stuff uh, because they're probably in line for as many innings as they can get. You know, they're mid-career guys, especially Ray. Um, you know, even Kirby and Gilbert, they've kind of, They've gone through the process. They're they're here. Uh, Kirby is projected for 143 innings from the bat. Uh, Gilbert 176, maybe because Gilbert's kind of like a year ahead. Um, so maybe Gilbert and Ray are more uh, there for their 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 quantity. And then uh, I think it'd be best if you could if you can manage it to pair. And so if you're going to pair and you're going to be more uh, cautious. 
on the front end, I think you'll take Ray or Gilbert, and then you could try and still get back in on this tier on the back end with Nick Lodolo, who I absolutely think him and Kyle Wright, I think, uh, you know, we saw real great stuff from them in small bursts last year. And, um, and I believe in them. So if you could get Wright and Snell or Lodolo who are at the back end of this tier and actually, uh, and, and, and combine them with more, uh, quantity in terms of Ray or Gilbert that I'm into it. I'm just not that into Ray. Uh, the stuff numbers have never really backed it up. I think the only reason he's good is because he throws a ton of sliders. I don't think the sinker was any good. We saw Jordan Alvarez demolish it. Um, and uh, I don't, uh, I, I kind of just keep waiting for it to not be good. Uh, maybe I could be wrong. Uh, so take Ray if you want. But if you wanted to pair Gilbert and Lodolo, that's a pretty exciting, you know, pairing there where you've got a real high floor guy who should get as many innings as you want in Gilbert. And then you get Nick Lodolo later who could be anything. Stuff says he's great. Well, how many innings will he get? He has injury on top of being young. Yeah, I mean, I think with with Ray, the good news is he held a lot of the control gains that we saw in 2021. Mm-hmm. That was expected. It was enough innings and a big enough change where I don't think anyone looked at Robbie Ray and said, he's going back to 10 plus percent walk rates. So that didn't happen. I think the the player I thought of when you said it's really just a, a good slider, I thought of Patrick Corbin. I think the key difference for me is for now, Robbie Ray throws a little harder than Patrick Corbin was throwing when Corbin fell off. But we're not seeing Robbie Ray in that close to 95 range with that fastball. We saw 93.4 as the average fastball velocity a season ago. This does seem like a profile where it might be better to be a year too early as opposed to a year too late. Because like getting off the bandwagon a year early, yeah. Right. He might be good for another year, maybe even another two years. That's possible. But when I look at all these guys going the other direction, especially Hunter Green, Hunter Green's filthy. And the thing that Hunter Green does statistically that I think is pretty interesting for pitchers in this group, his zone contact percentage is under 80%. And usually you don't see numbers under 80% unless you're looking at the very top of the starting pitcher ranking. So he has that, has the raw stuff. If you don't get hit in the zone as much as everybody else, that's a You just throw it in the zone. Then That's all you tell him is, man, your stuff is so nasty. Just throw it in the zone. You can get away with some inconsistencies with your command when you're that filthy. That's what I think we're seeing with Hunter Green right now. Yeah, for sure. Um, Lodolo's got a little bit more command, but he has a, a lot more injury risk. So fair, I think, for some people to take Snell over Lodolo uh, because of that. Uh, I guess you would set the over-under on innings pitched by either Snell or Lodolo probably around 145. Yeah, Snell, though, I would say you could probably file into the Severino bucket as far as if he becomes more efficient or if he's able to throw more innings, he'll throw more. They're not capping him by innings. Like he, mm-hmm. he needs Dollar to could actually run into a cap. Yep, that would be one of the differences for me is I could, I could see Snell green, getting into the green 165, into 170 range. Where are we at with Green? I mean, the, the old rubric was 120%. Last year, he had 132 innings, 133 innings. I don't think they'll push him much past 150. They might actually cap him at 150 or 160. Which I mean, is what, fine. Are they going to be good? But if he's, if, he's 100, if he gets to 160 innings, he might have 200 strikeouts. Right. And that, because of the way that team is likely to perform – it's probably just starting until they shut him down in early mid September. It's probably a pretty easy compared maybe, to a contender trying to nurse the playoffs and head to head. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's there's that, but I do like Hunter Green a lot in this range. I, I think this group, as it's currently constructed, makes me more comfortable with hitter heavy builds or even getting at least one closer, maybe two closers before you get to pick 100 if the board breaks the right way. And then you can sort of build up a rotation with a couple guys from this group and probably a couple guys from the next group. Um, Nestor Cortez is in this group. And by results, if people were just drafting based on what he did a year ago, he'd go much earlier. 244 ERA, 0.92 whip, uh, over a 20% K minus BB percentage a season ago. Why do you think people are a little bit hesitant to fully believe in Nestor? 
I think part of the problem is just we've had this history of pop-up uh, Yankee starters that I, I think of it as, I don't know, this is the, a name out of the memory books, but Aaron Small. We, we just – you get these guys who, you know, because they're on the uh, uh, on the Yankees, they win 12 games or something, and um, you know they get on a heater. And uh, because they're also on the Yankees, they get there's more exposure, so that people are like, oh yeah, 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 Aaron Small, he's great. Um, but I think we have a little bit more sophisticated tools under the belt here, and uh, I'm a little surprised to say this. It's a little bit more about uh, shape than it is about Velo. But, but Nestor Cortez did, over the course of last year, uh, add more Velo. And in fact, one of the things he said, uh, you, know, you know, by the end of the, you know, in September, he was throwing 92-2, which is still below average. But one of the things he said for, that was part of his breakout was getting to that because he was 89-90 before that. So at 92, uh, with a good vertical ride uh the best vertical ride of his career um on the four scene it's an above average pitch by stuff plus he definitely has good command of it that's one thing that he does really well and he's, he's an athlete you know he's a kind of a, a johnny cueto-esque guy where he can he can just pause in his delivery mid delivery and then still throw 92 you know what i mean like he's uh he's got all those different looks so people think there's not much stuff there but i would say in the four seamer and the cutter and the slider, he does have three above average uh, pitches by stuff plus. And then in terms of command, uh, he can really command the four seam um, and the cutter's pretty good. So, you know, I see him as, you know, kitchen sink guy, yes, but sneaky stuff, you know, like sneaky good stuff, especially on that four seam. So um, I don't mind taking him here. Uh, it is, he just, uh, for me, pales a little bit in comparison to some of the guys I have here around him. Um, I think Lou Severino will strike out more guys. Um, I think Hunter Green will strike out more guys, you know. I think Logan Gilbert may pitch more innings. Also, you know, if Cortez was at 89 a couple years ago, what's he going to be next year? Is he going to be 92 again, or is he going to be 91 minus? And I do think there's some risk as you start approaching. Uh, there used to be this, there was this great study back in the day that said that like, you know, between 90 and 94, any changes in VLO on the fastball were not that big a deal. 90, 94, this is you know, a little range. Um, and, and then beyond that, oh, beyond 94, every uh, homers and and whiffs, homers go down and whiffs go up on the fastball, right? And under 90, you know, the reverse happens. It's really bad. But between 90 and 94, you're just, you have a representative fastball, right? I bet that that has changed <laughs> because that, yes, that research was done when the average fastball was like 91 or 92. And so the range was like, you know, up to or uh, under two. Right now, the average fastball is 93 and a half. So I bet you you don't have really a plus-plus fastball just by Vila alone until you're over 96, at least 95. Uh, and that means probably on the low end, 91, you start getting into some trouble. 90 yeah. is the new 89, at least. Um, so, you know, if he falls back down to 91, 90... Uh, that's much more hittable. So I, I do, I do get a little bit nervous about that fastball. There's nobody, nobody in this group throws that slow. I mean, look at this group. There's nobody throwing 90 <laughs> or even 92. There's nobody throwing 92 except for Clayton Kershaw, maybe. And you just got to put Clayton Kershaw on his own. I don't know how to draft him. Do you know how to draft Clayton Kershaw? I have no idea what to do with him. He's always good when he's in. And every year we said, this is going to be year he gets Tommy John, or this is going to be year we, you know, we don't get any innings. And he always goes out there and he's always worth something and he's always good. Yeah. I, I mean, I think he's the guy I know Severino has the 99.7% <laughs> injury probability from the, the Jeff Zerman <laughs> calculation. I still think that's a, I, I get it. I understand the risks of Severino. That seems a little high to me. 99.7% seems accurate on Kershaw. <laughs> well, it's because, a percentile, so I know, it's not I know. Busy. <laughs> Still, it, it's just like, oh, okay. 120 innings, back-to-back -back seasons. It's been a little while since we've seen him even go over. We haven't seen him go over 180 since 2015. So I get that. We're looking at like six, seven seasons now 
where there's been something with Kershaw. How to draft him? He was the 19th uh, best pitcher last year. Yeah. Worth and, almost the same as Aaron Nola. I, so I was looking at the baseball forecaster that our friends over at Baseball HQ put together, and they were – I just started digging into this on Sunday. I didn't get a chance to finish it. But they have this, this breakdown of lost production in weekly leagues. And I think we've touched on it at some point in the past. Oh, like sometimes yeah. you, you lose stats because players in we your talk lineup. about a little bit more on hitters, right? Because you're like, oh, he's going to be yeah. taken out. He's he's not good defensively. He's going to be taken out, or he can't hit lefty. He's going to be taken out, or he's going to get platoon. Yeah, and I was just looking at the hitter breakdown. I didn't even get far enough to see what they've got in there for pitchers, but that's that's the forecaster for you. It's just awesome. I could see Clayton Kershaw being like, oh, he's just going to miss his next start. He'll be fine. But you put him in your lineup because you thought you guys were going to get in that start. And they announce on like Wednesday, oh, he's not gonna miss a start. Now you got a, just a zero in your lineup. Yeah. So is that is that but does that really describe what his injury history was like last year? Not entirely. I do see six days between a lot of starts. In fact, I see six days between all of his starts uh in in September. And it it's it, this is also this is also true. Kershaw was so rough in terms of like NFBC or uh, just leagues in general that don't have uh, either don't have ILs or don't have very much ILs. Imagine this is your life with Clayton Kershaw last year. You draft him. He's good. Uh, you know, has a little blow up. He's fine. Uh, he pitches through April. Uh, he pitches one start in May. And then he's gone for a month. All right. What do you do in that month? You're like, oh, but he was good. I'm going to hold on to him. Okay, I'm going to hold on to him. Now your bench is real thin, skinny. Uh, then he comes back in uh, in mid June, and he pitches every six days. These are still though, from a skills perspective and a ratios perspective, these are numbers you get from an SP one. So I think you hold on through those injuries even in leagues where you don't have any available IL spots or if your IL spots are limited and they're already filled by other players, you'd still want to find a way to keep him because he's a lot better than the players that are going to end up on your roster long-term as the replacements if you drop him. Now, at a certain point, if the injury is more than a month, you probably have to make that tough call and say, yeah, given his age, if it's a back injury, if they say a month, it could easily be more. I got to move on. So you have to accept that as part of the risk, but it comes down to what you've done with the rest of your staff. I think you can you can justify him in this range because everything still looks so steady. And it's so not a, a must draft of, sort of player. That's a little bit of an argument for, you know, like Gilbert and Ray and Kirby, maybe. I don't even know. What, what are we doing on Kirby for innings? But it's a little bit of an argument to keep your guys higher uh, by innings earlier so that you can take more shots like Kershaw later, right? Kirby's projected for 140 innings. He had 132 last year. 100? No, he had 154 last year. Dude, Kirby's good to go. Yeah, Kirby should be. I, Kirby's projection across That's the light. board is low. There's That's there's light. no reason why he can't go another 25 or 30 innings. I mean, the the issue with Kirby, if there is one, would be that the Mariners are a playoff caliber team. Managing him for the they playoffs. They might manage him for the playoffs. Things. So you have to yeah. worry about those those kind of innings dripping away. But I think the, the other way to look at Kershaw is start looking at the pitchers that are going to go after him. Which we're going to talk about those guys on an individual basis too. A lot of the guys you start to get 50 picks later, 75 picks later, they might even be fringy for the rotation, not because of skills, but because of the depth chart. So then you're waiting for an opportunity for someone to start. You're not dealing with that with Kershaw. If he's healthy, he's in. So you're exactly. not even, but you're, you're going to wait on somebody 50 or 70 picks later who almost certainly won't post ratios like that. Yeah, you might get that that K rate or slightly better, but you're not getting the possibility of a sub three ERA and a near one WHIP. That's Grayson gonna... Rodriguez goes sixty picks later. Yeah, is Grayson Rodriguez any less of a headache to manage on a roster with limited IL spots than Clayton Kershaw? I don't think so. I mean, like, how long are you going to hold on to Grayson Rodriguez before you know before you're like, oh, he's not coming up for a while? You know, in start workloads could be significantly problematic too. There's there's all sorts of ways that some of the young starters that we really like could be more frustrating to have on your roster than Kershaw. 
So I, did, I, I still maintain that I I understand that the the innings thing is almost like batting average. If you don't keep your batting average high, you don't keep your options open on the hitting side. If you don't keep your innings pretty flush, you don't keep your options open. Because, you know, another way of saying it is, you know, once you get down to Grayson Rodriguez, there's a bunch of guys uh, that have, you know, Edward Cabrera is 130 inning projection. Grayson Rodriguez, 130 inning projection. Uh, Lance McCullough is 140 inning projection. Uh, Chris Sale down here, 150 inning projection. By the way, uh, Chris Sale uh, had very similar model numbers and uh, a slightly higher injury risk. Um, but I don't know why he's projecting for half as much as Clayton Kershaw. So uh, Chris Sale, actually, I might say no to Kershaw where he's doing, but might take Chris Sale later because of what I'm saying right now, which is there's so many more pitchers you can take with low innings totals later that maybe right here innings should be a concern. So I think with Sale, uh, there was a story, I think Jim McCaffrey had it on The Athletic, it kind of sounded like he found a, a better place mentally after a year in which he had accidents on top of the recovery from a previous injury, right? It was the pinky, it was the bike accident. And just reading that story and, and just getting some of the, the the things he was saying, I was like, okay, this this guy seems like he's like coming off a pretty devastating year with a pretty healthy perspective and actual physical health on top of it. It's not as though when we've seen Sale, the skills have been radically different we've just seen him so infrequently over the last three years that you have to wonder how how much of the same guy is he is he 80 percent of the guy he used to be 90 percent like that's a bit of a guess but if you're like me and you're i believe you're in on luis severino too this is a similar amount of risk very high risk i don't know if you can justify having more than two guys like that on your pitching staff but you can get high-end sp2 maybe low-end sp1 quality innings from sale. When you do get them, yeah. And I he, just, he's not in this that group yet. Injury risk. I, yeah, that's why I, I think I agree with you that I look at Luis Severino at 99th percentile and be like, I'm not sure. I don't put him in the same bucket as Clayton Kershaw and Chris Sale. It's super high for all three of those guys, but there's still differences within that group. And I'm maybe I'm really dumb. But I'm just not that scared off by it because I think, didn't we say the, the same, the numbers on Cole, Garrett Cole, were like over 70, 70 percentile? Yeah. That dude's a fringe first rounder. Yeah, that seems also high to me. That almost seems like yeah, I'm the more other... to talk myself out of the early guys with that kind of projection than I am to talk myself out of the one hundred to one fifty range pitchers yeah. that are higher. And there's also the perspective, which is we're not that great at projecting injuries. We're you know we're not that great at pre- at preventing injuries, and pitchers still get hurt a ton. So, uh, you know, I, I've welcomed this year's trend, which seems to be to wait on pitchers a little bit. I've always been in that group because I, they just get hurt more often and they get hurt. They stay hurt longer when they get hurt, you know. So, uh, you know, if that's your perspective, then why not YOLO and, and, and just run through this uh, run through this tier with a, a Severino Kershaw Snell pick? Woo, baby. I just wonder if you could build a whole rotation got- starting in this range. What have, you, what have you got? What have you got? Six hundred innings from Severino, Snell, and Kershaw. No, that would never be absurd. <laughs> <laughs> You're winning everything. Crazy. Yeah. Congratulations! You you uh, drafted the Royal Flush and you won your league. It is. A, it you is actually pitching. instructive to me. I, I don't think that I noticed this uh, that Kershaw was pitching every sixth day. So, uh, I think he's a little bit more like Otani, the pitcher, where like he's got special rules now. Yeah, well, hey, there's some, five, that... there's some five day starts there, but there's a lot of every six day. I can live with that if the results are anything close to what they were in 2022. Um, the other two names we didn't get to in this group, real quick Logan Webb and Kyle Wright. I actually like them as relative values too. Yes, DVR likes pretty much everybody in this group. I, I think this is a this is where you definitely want to shop for pitching, whether you have a couple starters or not. It just determines how many pitchers you're going after in this range. The projection systems aren't as into Kyle Wright as I thought they'd be, and I wonder if maybe because of past struggles when he had a different arsenal, we're still catching some you know, pre-2022 numbers in that output that are a little bit unfair to him, right? I mean, this is kind of like the after Corbin Burns' big turnaround. You had the yeah. horrible results before that. Those were baked in, and you could look at it and say, wait a minute, that's, that's not quite right. I'm not saying Wright is Corbin Burns, but I'm saying I think the way projections work 
are going to kind of pull things further back than they should for Kyle Wright. But do you see anything in the arsenal, anything that happened over time last season that would give you some pause about expecting something closer to a repeat than projections that go above four for the ERA? Yeah, I I think that's what happened. You know, the last uh, the the two players that improved their stuff plus the most, the two starting pitchers that improved their stuff plus most from 2021 to 2022 are Kyle Wright and Mitch Keller. And I think it's fair to say that projection systems that don't include stuff plus will not uh, catch that because they are completely different players in terms of you know pitch mix and pitch movement and pitch below. Um, you know, Mitch Keller added a sweeper last year that was had the most horizontal movement among any sweeper in baseball. That's a completely new pitch that he didn't have before. So Kyle Wright, yeah, his his was a little bit more subtle, um, just kind of going away from the four seam fastball and building everything off the sinker instead, uh, throwing the curveball instead of the slider. Uh, you know, there are pretty intense changes, though. The fastball, forcing fastball went from 35% for Kyle Wright to 19%. The slider went from 27 to 7%. Uh, and the sinker went from 16 to 24. Not normally things that would improve your stuff plus, but in his case, his sinker was better than his four seam. I'm in on Kyle Wright. And, you know, for what it's worth, you were just talking about innings, 180 innings last year. He has the the kind of rare confluence of uh, as many innings as he wants and maybe being underrated by the projection systems and having the ability to be better. This is like George Kirby, you know, where Kirby's slider was changing over the course of the season. And he told me late in the season, I want to throw like a 90 mile an hour uh, uh, slider the way I'm throwing this one right now. It was 88. And by the end of the season, he was throwing at 90 miles an hour. So he's, I think, a pitching savant where he's just got great command and he's starting to shape the pitches to get more stuff on them. And he's able to do what he wants with the ball. So, you know, Kyle Wright and George Kirby, both of these guys are young guys with upside beyond this tier that we might be. I think these are the two guys in this tier that we could be talking about, you know, in, in the top 20 next year are those guys, George Kirby and, and, and Kyle Wright, because if they do it again, what they did before, now we're talking about a young guy in the middle of his career who might even still have a little bit more upside beyond, might be able to become an ace, but in any case, jumps out of this tier if they have another season like they did last year. You know, and I, I can put Logan Gilbert in there too. Um, Gilbert just suffers for me in, in, in how small his arsenal is. Right now, I think he's a two-pitch pitcher, and I haven't seen him put that change up together like I want him to. It's so strange, too, because when you look at the, the prospect grades over at Fangrass, it was fastball, slider, curveball, changeup when he was coming through as a prospect. It was four pitches, and they were all... The curve's never been any good at Rangers. It's so strange that it's it's worked out this way so far. It's a, I think it's one that looks good to scouts. It's like a big, it's a big curveball, uh, but it, 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 the stuff plus numbers are not good on it. And I think it's just um, somehow spotable or something for for hitters. Like just, it's not been a, a good weapon for him. Needs refinement. Logan Webb uh, and the guy that gets a ton of his outs. On the ground, we talked about this a bit on the first episode. Is he, like Framber Valdez, a bit more risky with the changes to the shift rules, especially on a team that seems to handle its infield defense a bit differently than a lot of other clubs? Yeah, it's true. What happens if J.D. Davis is playing third and Wilmer Flores is playing second and Logan Webb is on the mound? I don't think they'd do that, but I think they could. <laughs> <laughs> they, I when think Iro at second and Crawford at short those days. I would imagine. Yeah, oh, for for Webb's sake. Uh, one thing that was annoying for me it was watching Logan Webb's uh, release point drop uh, over the course of the season last year. Um, his four seam dropped. Uh, why? Why is this in feet? His four seam dropped point two feet. <laughs> I literally have to. I don't know why I have to do this, but two point four inches. I don't know. I guess, yeah, that's two point four inches. I, I'm, I, don't <laughs> I don't know. I I, I had to break out the calculator for that. It was an approximation, but I was. I was <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I'm wrong on those things, but I, you know, usually, usually anyway, I, right. I, I don't know if that's enough to worry about. I did uh, bring it up. Um, 
to somebody who coaches on the team and they were not worried about it. And they said, yeah, maybe it was dropping a little bit, but you know, that was just uh, Logan Webb putting together the biggest season of his career in terms of uh, quantity. Um, so they weren't worried about that. Uh, I do think he's at the nexus of uh, some of these uh, concerns that we have uh, for, for next year. He's been able to suppress home runs. Um, is the ball going to be the same next year? Uh, he's been able to, uh, get a lot of outs on ground balls, you know, are the shift rules going to affect him next year? Um, you know, there's, there's definitely some concerns about, uh, how differently AT&T park has, 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 has played with the, uh, with the changes they've made to that park. Um, you know, and, and, uh, this is interesting. I hadn't thought about this before just now. Um, but there is a big new building going up next to, uh, AT&T park. And we know uh, from our friend Ken Arneson that big buildings around ballparks create wind shadows, and that can change how, how games are played. There are huge new condos and stuff. Like if, you, if you're looking uh, towards first base in, in San Francisco, on that side, there's a whole new building there that wasn't there all last year. That was in the process of being built, and now it's built. So that could change things. So, you know, there's a lot of things with Logan Webb and, and, and I think he, he opens us up to a broader discussion here real quick of just uh, how difficult it is uh, recent has been recently. I know we have all these new tools that can be more refined and we, and we now can test the drag on a ball uh, from the course of throwing it to the, to the, to the plate 50 feet away. Like we, we are very minute on what we can, what we can do, but we also in the off season have to shut all that off and decide, you know, Hey, uh, you know, when, um, you know, what is going to happen this year? <laughs> like the, the ball seems to be changing every year. We had this great uh, work from Bradford, uh, Davis and 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 uh, Meredith Wills at Business Insider, where they showed that the you know the the ball there was you know uh, th their work uh, they showed a graph that showed that like there was three different balls. Uh, when I look at that graph, I, I, I think there was um, maybe two different balls. The 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 Goldilocks ball that they talk about was within the range of the other ball. Um, and so I don't know if it's just me, there's more information that wasn't on the graph, but just from the graph itself, um, the difference between the red and the blue balls on that graph on, on, on business insider is not super clear to me. Um, you know, they could be just one ball that's, that has a sort of a wide spec there. Um, but there is one ball that's way out there that they, they found six balls that were just completely, uh, out of left field. So that's weird. They were supposed to be using one ball last year. Either they used three balls or they use two balls or they, you know, they use some leftover balls and they use one ball that had a pretty wide range of specs, which is a little bit surprising, not surprising if you've been following along, but a little bit annoying if you're us, you know, and the lastly, the last bit that, that was in that study that was about, um, you know, where the balls, they said that they found these Goldilocks balls mostly um, at Yankees games and in the postseason and other commemorative places. Um, to me, that says something maybe a little bit different than what's been out in the discourse, which is that the that baseball was feeding Aaron Judge balls in order to win the uh, to, to, to beat the, the record and get, you know, get, you know, we can stop mentioning you know, unmentionable players, you know? <laughs> like, you know, give him some sort of home run record that doesn't have anything to do with steroids. Um, I don't think baseball did that. And I don't think that those numbers prove that because they were limited. They, they weren't able to get a random sampling of balls from every ballpark. You know, they were limited into what was sent them. So when I see that the Goldilocks balls they were talking about showed up at all the commemorative places, including the postseason, other commemorative games, the all-star game and judge, what it says to me is they had one pallet. They had one batch that they made commemorative balls out of. And so all those balls are similar. So that's a, called a batch effect. Now, if baseball wants to get away from the batch effect, they could just mix all the balls, you know, uh, throw them all into a big vat and take them out randomly, you know, <laughs> um, if they care about it. Uh, from, a, from a studying standpoint, you'd have to get a truly random sampling of balls, which I think is almost impossible from the outside because we have no cooperation from Major League Baseball. So I think Meredith Wills is doing a great job. I think that story was great. I don't have the same takeaways as everybody else. I say 
I think that baseball has a batch effect. So sometimes, you know, balls in, that going certain places are going to be springier than other balls. I think that it's a man-made thing. You know, people, there are different people, you know, there are different people actually doing the work. And so if it comes from one shift or another, like that could be meaningful. You know, that's just a, another human that did it differently from the other guy. So there's going to be batch effects and whether or not baseball cares about it or what we should do about it. I don't know. <laughs> so I generally just sort of try to hew close to the, the skill, the skills that I have in identifying good pitchers, the tools I have and projections and kind of go along. So for me, Logan Webb, especially after the updated uh, run uh, has above average stuff, above average command, a large mix of, um, there was some softening on his slider last year and I want him to improve that slider, but I'm sure that he knows about that. And I think he can back to, uh, you know, eight K's per nine, uh, you know, should be good for, uh, you know, a lot of volume, all the innings you want a little bit boring in this range. I don't think he has the upside of Wright and Kirby and Gilbert and green. Uh, but if you want to focus on innings, I think he's a pretty good place to start. Yeah, a good bulk starter. I mean, if you're trying to offset some of the younger starters or more uh, injury risk starters that you've got in tow already, then Webb can help kind of counterbalance that pretty effectively in this range. The park, even if it changes some, should still go a long way towards really keeping that floor nice and high. And I just wonder with Webb, could we see more strikeouts? We did see that in 2021. The swing strike rate came down a little bit. The approach in the past hasn't necessarily been to be a strikeout machine. He's he's just trying to get guys to pound the ball into the ground. Maybe you can split the difference between this past season's K rate and 2021. You could see him in that 23% range, which would be fine. Over the number of innings he throws, that ends up being a really nice K total for somebody going in this range. In a lot of ways, I know that Lance Lynn, I don't think Lance Lynn's ever got nearly as many ground balls as Logan Webb does. It's that Lance Lynn horse sort of build. And Lynn goes in this next group, by the way. This next cluster is Lance Lynn, and Joe Ryan, Freddie Peralta, Jesus Lazardo, Lucas Giolito, and Chris Bassett. There are weird things about just about everybody in this cluster. Lance Lynn missed a lot of time with injuries last year, throws a ton of fastballs. The fastballs are very different, but we're starting to see some warts there. Joe Ryan. Really odd sort of picture getting great results. Did it really over a full season last year in Minnesota. You know, Freddie Peralta isn't just fastball Freddie anymore, but he got hurt again. Missed significant time with an arm injury. So there's there's legitimate risk there. We've seen the Brewers go to a six-man rotation. So innings, I think, will be capped for Freddie in some way. Jesus Lazardo, a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde. Ended up pitching really well at times last year. Giolito fell apart. And now Chris Bassett goes to Toronto where there may be some changes to the ballpark. We're going to see how those actually project out, but that's going to be a more difficult place to pitch, even no matter what those changes are than city field was the last the, a year ago and more difficult than the Oakland Coliseum was before that. So yeah. all of these guys have different things going on. And I think it could be, it could be one of the trickiest couple of rounds to navigate pitching and almost one that if you don't want to deal with headaches, you could sidestep entirely. Yeah, it's kind of funny that this works out this way because if you look at uh, you've got this this cool spreadsheet where you've got our our rankings and against ADP and uh, we are lower than the market on almost all of these guys. Uh, Just oh, not everybody except for uh, oh, oh, knock me over with a feather. Freddie Peralta on your list. Shocker, right? <laughs> Who'd have thought? Who saw that one coming? <laughs> it's the least surprising oh, thing ever. Oh, God, I love it. That's great. No, I mean, hey, uh, maybe he should be higher on my list because that's a good, really good stuff plus number. And, you know, it was just a question of, of injury concern for me. Um, you know, going, I, I don't know. I have him at 50. I think you know, 39 where the ADP is maybe a better place to put him, but I doubt that means that I'm going to get him a lot of places. And in fact, uh, this group here uh, as a whole, I think I'm just going to miss out on. Uh, there's nobody here that I'm really higher on than consensus. I see uh, just a lot of question marks. Jesus Lazardo had, you know, one of the better uh, seasons in this group. And when he came back off the IL, he lost fastball velocity and stuff plus. And for the season, he had a below average stuff plus. 
He's never been that good at locating pitches. So I don't know what I'm hanging my hat on other than the park. Now, there are places in this draft where I will just draft a guy based on park. I just took Alex Wood to be my final starter in a draft and hold in the 30 something round, you know, that was mostly park. I mean, I like Alex Wood, but that was mostly park. Uh, I don't see, I don't want to take a guy uh, to be my, in this range in the, you know, the 40th starting among the, the top 40 starting pitchers. I don't want him to be just the park. And, uh, so I, I, you know, Joe Ryan, it, it, the Minnesota was very interesting. They were way, way out in front on Kinetrax, which is a, a limb tracking uh, software. And a lot of people have said, well, Kinetrax is, is out of date now because we have Hawkeye and Hawkeye can just track all this, you know, with all these cameras and it's, you know, Hawkeye is going to be great and we don't need Kinetrax. Well, uh, the twins and some other teams decided to stick with Kinetrax because they'd already implemented it all their minor league places. They'd already paid for it. They already did the, the, the research. They already, so they've been out on front on limb tracking and it has not, it has not had any good when it comes to injury for their guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, uh, it's possible that they uh, were studying deception. And that deception based on the way your limbs are coming through or limb angles. Bailey Ober is like tall and way up here. And you know what I mean? Like Joe Ryan has like a weird low, but high low release point, but kind of good high move, like good ride kind of combo. So anyway, in some way, I think they are out in front on deception. And I think Joe Ryan captures that. The only problem for me and betting on deception is does it ever run out? If you're the – who did he see the most last year? Joe Ryan saw Cleveland one, two, three times. Um, you know, third time he's still seven and two-thirds scoreless. So, you know, three times is not enough. But what if you're on your sixth time seeing Joe Ryan? What if you're on your eighth time seeing Joe Ryan? You know, and especially if you start talking about plate appearances. What if you start – what if you're seeing your hundredth pitch – from Joe Ryan. Like when, when does it, when does it turn into, okay, I got it. I know where to look. <laughs> yeah. Do you, in the model, do you see any of those secondaries being better than the results? I, I look at the slider and the change up opposing hitters hit nearly 500 against those two pitches. I mean, that's, that's part of the problem for me. I, I'm not sure I see anything else other than that fastball that, yeah, it's, it's definitely good. the fastball. The the fourteen fastball, one hundred four stuff plus, one hundred five, one hundred six location plus. Great slider, ninety five stuff plus. He located it well, but that's that's pretty bad too for a slider. Like Mint's model loves sliders. Curveball, eighty three stuff plus. Changeup, seventy six stuff plus. So you're right. There's a little bit of a fastball only thing. Hey, but you had fastball Freddy for a while. You know, maybe there's maybe Ryan can make that Pitch adjustment. Change. Yeah, pitchers but, uh, change. It's, I, it's but I in that and that would be annoying to me because I think I have a sense of who he is and I'm not I'm not, I'm not in on him here. Um, but and he could change and be better and make everyone else right and me wrong. Um, but you know, given what he has now, I think he's a, a low four ZRA pitcher that uh, gets a lot of pop ups, get a lot of strike offs off the fastball. But if if he's having any trouble locating that fastball, he doesn't really have any other weapons. Yeah, and I think if you said take another pitcher from this group, I and mean, clearly Freddie's the the pitcher I'd like because of deeper arsenal. He's got two breaking balls now. Guys just take such weird swings against Freddie Peralta. That's part of it too. You can just tell it's an uncomfortable at bat, especially for righties. I look at Jesus Lazardo. I think he's still the guy that I like the most. But as you can tell from the first two and a half hours of pitcher week. I'm taking on a good bit of injury risk with my pitchers. So around this range, I have to probably say this is my last significantly injury prone pitcher and start to back off. So it depends on who I've got already. I know it's a little bit of a cop out, but I got a 332 ERA, 104 whip last year over a strikeout per inning. If you're looking for the the other guy that could leap up and be just as good as much of a, a breakout as Freddie, Freddie would be more of a rebound because he actually did it once before, but right. Lizardo could take a leap like that. You do have probably some built-in workload limitations there, though, because even last season, it was 111, 112 innings, I think, across rehab work and what he did in the big leagues. So he's going to get to about 150, and 
that's going to be it. But you, you're you fine with that in this range because you know around pick 140, 150, that's going to happen a lot. But if you took Luis Severino in the last in the last tier and you didn't get a second one, and then you come into the here and you take Freddy Peralta in this tier, you are loading up. And that means in the next tier, uh, you have to take somebody really boring for innings. And I think uh, that would be Jordan Montgomery, mm. which uh, it's not terrible. But yeah, yeah. You know, it does take you out of like, could you really on one team? And this is this is like, I'm not looking into risk and I'm just taking the guy I want. What if I took Luis Severino and then I went Freddie Peralta and then I went Dustin May? Woo! I would feel excited. I'd be on top of the world until when? May? <laughs> yeah, this May was in my head. <laughs> That's because I said Dustin May. May. Yeah, Brian does. No. <laughs> Honestly, though, it, as you're talking about this, I'm like, no, I'd build a team like that. I, I, I feel good enough about the skills where I feel like the injury risk is worth it. You just taking. go to the waiver wire? You wouldn't do that in, a, in, a, in an only. I don't think it even works in an only, no. Well, yeah, I mean, with Severino, Sale, and, you know, whatever, you get, you get two or three guys that are super high risk in, in an only league, and then you, you lose them, replacing those innings is impossible. So, yeah. You're in a 12-team league. You're going to play, like, the Rotowire Online Championship, the 12-team NFC no, league. Severino, Peralta, May, yeah. I think this is where you want to live. You want to be real aggressive around this group, and you can take on that extra risk because I think in a 12, in a 12-team league, you will find more pitching on the wire. You can stream on the wire a lot easier than in a 15. 15 team leagues, as we both learned last year, you start losing top end pitching. It is very hard going up against sharp players to get the quality of the innings that you need to backfill. And the ratios, once they start tipping over, it's like that vending machine that you've tipped on your friend back in your boarding school days. You're not getting out from underneath those ratios at a certain point. It's just over. So if that vending machine starts wobbling April and May, you better write the ship quickly because if it tips over on you in June, you're not fixing it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't get out from under that. <laughs> both, <laughs> both the vending machine and the bad ratios. Uh, Dustin May, I think much like Chris Sale, both of those guys could trend up pretty easily. I think we're already going to see it with Sale. I think if May comes out this spring, he's absolutely on a watch list where it's like Velo looks good. Command looks crisp. He's a clear what could go right sort of player. And I thought I, I thought we saw flashes of it coming off of Tommy John last year where he he ended up with results that weren't very good. A 450 ERA it was only 30 innings. And I think that actually is tempering early draft season expectations just a little bit. But I don't expect him to walk 11% of the batters that he faced. He didn't have a walk problem previously in the big leagues. I think there is another question of how the Dodgers will use him. Is he going to get five plus innings every single start if he's efficient? Or are they going to try and piggyback someone with him? Like, what is their what is their approach to Dustin May's workload, given that he's never had that big workload in the upper levels of the minor leagues before? The, the best we've got is probably 2018, and that was 132 and two-thirds innings between them high A and double A. So that was five years ago. So how much can you project off of that innings wise for May? I mean, at some point the, the, the kid gloves have to come off, you know, at some point you just have to let him go. And there is the, such a thing as the Tommy John honeymoon. Uh, there might be such a thing as preparing for the, the postseason. So he might get caught in between both of those. Um, but like I, I don't I don't know how instructive it is to look back at his career high of fifty six innings and be like, okay, he's going to get seventy five this year. <laughs> right? Yeah. I, no, I, I think I think when we're trying to project workloads for pitchers, regardless of where they're at, look back at the entire career, including the minor leagues, because that gives you the upper bound of what they've already done over a season before. I think I think a team is much more likely to look back at that and go, okay. We've seen this. If we push him 20% more than that, that should still be within a healthy, normal range. So his career high is around 135 innings. Right. So the ceiling would be about 160 for this year. That's, yeah. where, I, that's where I'd put it anyway. 
I think 150. Um, which is a little bit more concerned than I was. I was kind of uh, up in the uh, Tommy John honeymoon weeds and just being like, yay. Uh, but, um, uh, and I think I did just take him and I paired him with Tyler Glass now on this team, didn't I? I did. I did. So, uh, <laughs> you, you know, you were talking about sort of prancing through the weeds and grabbing all the, uh, all the, uh, all the injury risk guys. I, I went glass now, may Rasmussen. So, um, but, uh, you know, there is some oatmeal later in this, tr- in this deal. Um, I took Jameson Tyon and Alex Wood later on and they don't seem like great, uh, number guys for injury for innings, but they should get a hundred innings each and at some point in these drafting holes in particular you're just trying to gather 100 innings per pitcher you know you're just trying to get to a certain number right just having enough guys on the roster who don't all break simultaneously to kill yeah. the line that is, is i don't know how many times i've had a basement full of swiss flags if you know what i mean where i'm just i'm starting every pitcher that's healthy right now i did pick you know, 18 starting pitchers and I'm starting all the ones that are healthy right now. I got six, <laughs> seven are on the IL two are in the minors. And yeah, exactly. That is what life is like. Luis Garcia goes in this group. He's had a little bit of a struggle as seasons have worn on each of the last two years. It seems like the fatigue becomes a bit of an issue for him uh, right in that sub 160 range for regular season innings. Is this sort of, what he is, or do you think he can break through and add another 20 to 30 innings and remain effective over a full season? Did the arsenal's deep enough and the stuff is good enough for that to happen, or should we temper our expectations a bit? I just don't like the fades, right? Doesn't he? He fades every year, and uh, and he like he has gotten it back in the in the postseason, he's gotten it from start to start where it was like 92 one start and 94 the next, so um, you know, but uh, generally. Uh, I, I think of him as fading, but you know, it's good to check your, what you think of, uh, against the actual numbers. What I see here, now that I look at it, Luis Garcia started 2021 with a 93, six, uh, and ended, uh, with a 93, three in September, 94, nine in October and 95 in November. Um, he started last year, 94 for the season, which is higher than he started the year before. Ended the season in September, August, September, 93, 9, 94, 3, uh, and uh, 94, 3 in October. So where, where am I getting this idea that he fades? Does he have, does he have it's, bad it's splits? The results. It's, yeah, it's, it's the, the ratios. Mm-hmm. So, so what, is, what are his second half results like? Well, the thing I'm looking at right now is the workload compared to the guys that are being drafted ahead of him. Mm-hmm. Luis Garcia, if you've thrown 300 innings over the previous two seasons combined, it's actually pretty good for 21 yeah. and 22 when you look at this overall list, especially outside the top 100 overall pitchers because you get a bunch of, of rookies that have come in, guys that have dealt with the injury issues. Luis Garcia has thrown more innings the last two seasons than almost everybody that we've talked about on the pod today. The only exceptions are Robbie Ray, Logan Webb, uh, Giolito, and Bassett. That's it. Wow. Otherwise, everybody else we've discussed today in these groups, Garcia's thrown more innings than all of them. And even the first, second half splits, I am seeing, uh, you know, a difference in ERA. Uh, first half, 336 for his career, 381 in the second half. Uh, it is supported a little bit by some dropping off in, you know, like strikes, my, strike on his walks. First half, 19.4. Second half, 15.2. That 15.2 number's. Uh, just a slightly above league average. I think league average is around 13% right now. Um, but his FIP in the first half, 381, 379 in the second. So maybe just a little bit of poor luck. Also, we reran the model and we included cutters with fastballs. Um, and I think Luis Garcia's cutter, he, he kind of uses it both as a fastball and as a breaking pitch. But, um, you know, including cutters within fastballs, his stuff plus number jumps. And all of a sudden, he looks like somebody who should be way higher than 48th on my rankings. So I don't know. I think he's um, now that I'm looking at all this. I think there's an up arrow next to him. I'm gonna I'm gonna change the the number here, and he's gonna jump ahead of some of those guys that were in the last year, and probably be in the low 40s. Uh, like let me give you. Would you rather? 
Luis Garcia or Drew Rasmussen? <sighs> Rasmussen, but um, they're very close for me. Mm, well, they are close right now. All right, well, that didn't help. Uh, <laughs> Luis Garcia or Charlie Morton? Mm, I'm a Charlie Morton apologist. I, Charlie Morton for me. Yeah. All right, well, maybe I have in the right place. Uh, okay, I'll just do the guys right ahead of him. Alex Cobb, uh, Chris Bassett, Jeffrey Springs. You'd have Luis Garcia over those guys at least. Uh, not Bassett. Probably not Bassett, yeah. All right. So we just did it. We're changing it. Appropriately rated. I like him in this tier. I don't want to push him up. I don't know if there's anything else there. I don't know if there has to be. I think Garcia versus Pablo Lopez going from Miami to Minnesota. I think that's an interesting toss-up. I think Pablo Lopez has... Some health concerns in this range, which well, who doesn't? Who doesn't have health concerns on the pitching side? But what do you think of him moving to Minnesota? Do you, do you think Pablo Lopez can actually do anything differently? Do you think he can unlock another level? Yeah, you know, uh, once we redid uh, the model, his his changeup is above average. Uh, maybe the model is missing something because, um, you know, it's not amazing on changeups. And, you know, just calling his changeup above average uh, seems a little bit unfair. Um, but, uh, you know, he's got a, a good curveball uh, that uh, performs better and looks better in the model than his cutter. Um and uh, there could be uh, some more sinkers mixed in. It, it rates about the same as his four-seam fastball and would give him a different look. So there are some things that can be tweaked. Um, and uh, the cutter maybe uh, could have a different shape uh, going forward. So uh, he's a, he is a, the typical twin starter in that he has five pitches and command of most of them. You know, that's, that's another thing the, the, the twins like to do is command um, and, and multiple pitches. So... You know, I, I think it's a I think it's a good landing place for him. I'm interested to see what the uh, the the coaching does for him. Um, also, though, every twin starter seems to get hurt when they land in Minnesota. I don't know. That doesn't seem like something I can bank on. <laughs> but no. I think just generally, he lines up right at ADP, and that means that um, for me, like it, honestly, ADP has him as the 46, and I am as 46. So. I'm not that far off on the market, you know, despite what my model says. That's a weird thing, though. That might mean that I don't get him a lot, even though it seems like that should work out. What that means is there are other guys that I will have above him. You know what I mean? Like, there'll be other guys that I'll just take above him. For example, I filled. May, yeah, yeah, I would have filled that spot. Yeah, I've just yeah. made 12 points ahead of ADP, and he's two, point, two guys ahead of Pablo Lopez. I'm just much more likely to have Dustin May on my team than Pablo Lopez. Yeah, you're you're more likely to end up with Lopez in a room full of people who are drafting off your rankings or looking at the pool the same way you do. In that case, then he just might be the best option there. It might be the last in a in a cluster where you say, I, "I like him enough. This is fine. It's a little oatmeal-y, but it actually works." Um, I like Jordan Montgomery outside of of Yankee Stadium for a full season. I mean, I think being in St. Louis, it's a great landing spot. We've seen better K rates from him in the past. I think the home run risk we've seen at times from him. That comes down a bit being in St. Louis as well. We, ratios were as good as they've ever been. I don't know if I'm going anywhere near a 109 whip for my expectations for him, but you see pretty consistently across the board, kind of a just above a mid threes ERA and a whip right around right around 120. That's fine. Like, I'm real happy with that with Montgomery, and I think there should be bulk there compared to a lot of other pitchers that we like that we've talked about. I feel like there's slightly less injury concern for me with Montgomery in the short term. Yeah, it's weird. He he, he came there and uh, the Cardinals said, throw your four seam more. And I don't know if there's some sort of interactive effects. Maybe it made his change up better, but uh, the four seam and the cutter are like very much the, uh, his two worst pitches in the model. It likes him much more as a sinker curveball change up guy. Uh, and that's uh, more what the the Yankees had him doing. So um, it is weird that he had uh, success with them doing this approach, didn't he? Uh, it, it kind of hard to pull that out of what you would uh, say is just sort of natural park effects. That's one of the more extreme uh, park changes you can make. Uh, but his strikeout rate, his strike like his strikeout rate went up, but his whiff rate went down. Um, I would just feel much safer 
not looking at those two partial seasons and just looking at the full season and saying, this is a guy who won't strike out a bunch of guys, but should have good ratios. And if he has enough innings pitched, then the strikeout rate is not as much of a concern. What if he has 150, if he has 175 innings pitched, he should get at least 150 uh, strikeouts. And there are other people in this group that you'd, you'd, you'd hope got enough innings to get to 150 strikeouts. <laughs> So, you know, he's definitely uh, Oatmealy. I think his uh, health percentiles, I would be interested in seeing that. His health percentiles versus uh, Pablo Lopez. Here we go. Uh, Pablo uh, Lopez, 66th injury percentile, and Jordan Montgomery, 61. So closer yeah. than I expected. Similar. I just think when Montgomery was with the Yankees, because of the park, it was easy to look at him as a guy that was really matchup dependent. Getting out of Yankee Stadium, those are the kinds of skills that in the deeper mix leagues I play in, he's much more in the lineup than out. It's going to be a rare, oh, they're on the road facing the Dodgers. I guess I'll, I'll sit Jordan Montgomery this week. You know, I, I think he's probably 80 Don't plus you want to get an every starter? Lineup. Or This is sort of actually where you start losing the, the, the idea that you're going to start this guy every time. I do think that, you know, if, Louis, if Dustin May is healthy, he's a starter every time he's out there. I do think Luis Garcia starts for you every time. So the beginning of this tier, you're still getting guys you think you can start every time, right? Yeah, I almost wonder if that's the difference between this group and the like kind of smaller next group that gets wedged in just before we get to pick 200. There are uh, definitely more use case scenarios here where, you know, do, yeah. yeah. Do I start Drew Rasmussen in Yankee Stadium as much as I like him? Um, you know, do I start John Gray in, you know, in Colorado? <laughs> wow. In, in Houston. <laughs> yeah. In Houston. Right. That's the one. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's more questions than that next group. I think this, this group is fairly safe. I think you would start Jordan Montgomery most times. Uh, Chris Sale, if he's healthy, you start him all the time. Charlie Morton, you know, he has had some weird shapes to his season. And I think that's just going to continue as he gets older. He's just going to have some bad stretches as, as he gets older. Um, there to me, I have an absolute do not draft on Tony Gonsolin. Um, the do just, not draft. Wow. So what's, what's the reasoning? Why do you, why is he a do not draft? Well, I mean, it's not a strict do not draft, but I have him at 70 and the ADP is 50 and it's the biggest disparity in this group. And the, I have a, a, a double edged reasoning, which is model never liked him. That's one thing, but no pitcher in baseball benefited more from the shift last year than Tony Gonsolin. So you've got a guy who does not strike out uh, people that much. He's sort of basically league average in strikeout rate. Um, a righty who's going to give up hits to lefties, except, oh, the shift happens to be exactly where, you know, the, where he that needs to be. His projections are awful. Uh, 437, 132, what is that? That's the bat. Uh, that's easily the worst projection uh, in the ne- in the top sixty pitchers that I see. Yeah, I think that was that's that's steamer. I labeled I labeled it wrong in the sheet. That steamer projection. So the bat's not that much better. It's four twenty four one twenty nine. I something is something's different about Gonsolin, even beyond the benefits from the shift and the defense behind him. Though, like I don't I don't know if that can completely cover the gap between the pitcher he projects to be. And a guy with a 251 ERA and a .99 WHIP over 272 and two thirds career innings. I'm a little more intrigued by Gonsolin than say Joe Ryan. They're probably top and bottom of the same cluster for me, and I'm a little more likely to end up with Gonsolin than I am to end up with Ryan. But I think this fits into what you said about Pablo Lopez, where he's fine. There are other guys I like more, and because I like those other guys more, I'll probably miss on Gonsolin, even though I don't have him ranked below where the market does. I actually have him a tick ahead. It's just just the way teams are are built. It's not going to work out for me to have him. Yeah, I, I also just think back to that playoffs where he was unusable. and That's when he got hurt, though, right? That was that shoulder. Yeah, uh, but yeah, like... W- but w- what came first, you know? Um, I mean, just his total postseason, like his total postseason work is just just bad. I mean, he has a 920 ERA and four, it's just 14 innings. And yeah, okay. All right. I wouldn't, like if he was up for the Hall of Fame and he had bad postseason numbers, I would, you know, and he, but he had great regular season numbers. I'd probably still vote for him. 
Um, but it is just weird for me that all like all the stuff my model says that he doesn't have great command and he's had he's got a really bad fastball. It shows up in the postseason, <laughs> you know, like, but not in the regular season. So I don't, I don't really know what's going on there. And I, you're right, the career numbers are pristine. It's a, it's a heck of a magic trick, at the very least. Even if I can't fully explain to you how he does it, look at two twenty one though. He did have a five and a half walk rate that year. So I just think this is not great command. What the model actually says is the split finger is great, the curveball and slider are good, uh, and the four seam is bad, but he looks at, locates it okay. So what you're, what, I think what you're seeing in the regular season is he gets ahead enough uh, with the four seam and the, and the slider, uh, two pitches he commands the best, um, and he gets ahead enough with that. Where what are you going to do against that split finger? You know, I just. I don't know why the model doesn't sum that up better and like him better because he throws 809 four seamers over the course of the season with a 80 stuff plus, you know, that's going to be a big anchor on all of it. And I think at some point that's going to come back and bite him in the butt. Yeah, you might be right. I, I like that you're trusting the model here though. I, I'm glad that you're sticking to it. The last group and we'll kind of fly through this. Cause we've mentioned a couple of these guys already. We got Jeffrey Springs, Drew Rasmussen, Brady Singer, Grayson Rodriguez, and John Gray. This rounds out the top 200. Springs is one of those guys, if you didn't have him on your roster, much like Brady Singer, you may have missed just how good he was last year. 26% K rate, only a 5% walk rate. Ratios were outstanding. You don't have to get anything close to that in this range to be happy with him this year. Do you see anything in the underlying numbers that would make you believe the correction on Springs might be more harsh than the projection suggests? Not really, other than, uh, you know, he does not, uh, he, you know, he has a good four-seam fastball. Um, he does not have a standout stuff. So the slider is just around average by stuff, but he locates it well. The changeup is, you know, average-ish by stuff. He locates it well. So he is stripling esque you know he is like one of these guys just has a bunch of pitches and locates them well you know so i think that can get in trouble sometimes uh either when he's not locating well which command is not a sticky year to year or uh when teams come up with some sort of strategy to defeat it that he he doesn't have something where you can reach back and be like oh you anticipated this pitch in the location that i'm throwing it but you still can't hit it you know some glass now has that yeah, you know, like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, you, you, you think you know where the slider's going? Well, then hit it. <laughs> I don't, Springs doesn't have that. Uh, Rasmussen yeah. actually has more weapons that are like that. That, that curveball in Rasmussen is uh, a real legit uh, stuff weapon. And so, you know, that's why I have Rasmussen one ahead of Springs. And then in our last discussion, um, you know, with Luis Garcia, I, I pushed uh, Luis Garcia ahead of, um, ahead of Jeffrey Springs. So, um, I just have springs around ADP. I like him. I think if you, if I was going to end up with somebody in this grouping, um, I might uh, go to bat for John Gray. John Gray added a sweeper last year. So you sideways slider that goes with his traditional up down slider that I think could be more powerful than his curveball. And so you've got the sweeper, the slider and the four seam has always been sort of meh, but it's a good park. Um, he should, you know, he's projected for 174 innings at second most in this, in this tier. So a, a, a good combination, especially if you've gone pretty hardcore on injury risk, uh, in your last three tiers, if you, if you did the, the Severino Peralta may build, maybe throwing gray in there, uh, to make sure you have a healthy arm or, a, or at least for more innings, uh, might be a good idea. Yeah, I think that's a good case. That adjustment, getting out of Colorado, just a lot of things that went in the right direction for Gray. And had he not lost a little bit of time to injury of his own, I think people would be even more excited about what he did during his first season in Texas. Uh, With Brady Singer, I look at him and I just say, hey, man, like your K rate was pretty good, but your swinging strike rate wasn't very good. I'm just not sure I believe the strikeouts come back around. And if he's giving up more contact, is he going to be as effective as he was in 2022? Just it's really hard for me to tell myself a story with him that he's reached this new level that's going to be sustainable going forward, even though he might be Kansas City's most reliable starter for the foreseeable future. Might be hurt a little bit by, uh, you know, not uh, facing divisional foes as much. Um, 
And, uh, you know, the changeup, he threw 322 last year, had a 217 batting average against uh, four extra base hits. Uh, so it's very tempting to say that's a great pitch. He, sh- he could throw it more and be even better. Uh, I don't know if I'm seeing it. 66 stuff plus 93 location plus. I think he was kind of over his skis on that. Um, it has exactly the same movement as a sinker and a six mile an hour velocity gap. Hmm. I'm sorry. That's just no one's ever had success with a, sin- a change up like that. <laughs> it's like there, there was no other change up. That's like, Oh, but what about this guy? No, nobody, nobody has success where it looks exactly like the sinker and has six mile an hour velocity gap. If he had a 12 mile an hour velocity gap, and looked exactly like a sinker, then he could be in the sort of straight change grouping, the the Marco Estrada grouping, the John Means grouping. But uh, with a six hour velocity gap, uh, I just think that if you prepare for the sinker and you get the exact same movement, but six hour miles fa- like lower, what you're going to do is deposit it the other way. No, you're going to be early on it. You're going to you you're going to deposit it in the seats. <laughs> Right. With six mile hour gap is just not that much in terms of where it shows up at the plate. It's like two or three inches and launch angle peaks in front of the plate. So if you prepare for 93, you get 87 and it's the exact same movement. So your bat's in the right place. You're going to be early on it and you're just going to pull a fly ball, which is the best ball and the best batter ball in baseball. So that's I've described where I think will happen with Singer this year. But I do the, the fastball and the slider. Absolutely. The slider is a great pitch. He locates it well. The fast, the, the sinker is a decent pitch. They locates well. So he's a, he's an upscale uh, sinker slider guy. And uh, I used to make the case that Justin Masterson was good despite only having two pitches, but you know, the, the time ran out on Justin Masterson and the time will run out on Brady Singer as well. Yeah, Aaron small references, Justin Masterson references. <laughs> this is amazing. What what year is this? Uh, as, I mentioned, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, Grayson Rodriguez, great prospect, goes in a spot though where because of the way his innings are going to probably be tightly managed, he could be a problem player in your lineup in weekly leagues. I love him in keeper and dynasty leagues. I think it's it's a matter of lacking other younger pitchers that go 50 picks later, 100 picks later to be more reliable from a workload perspective. You might not find a pitcher with a better ceiling than Rodriguez as far as guys that haven't debuted yet, but it's going to be a bit of a, a grind, I think, to get those innings where you want them to be because in-start workloads for Grace and Rodriguez have been managed very carefully throughout his time in the minor leagues. You know, what's interesting is that sometimes the uh, the course or the, the, the trajectory of a whole organization, uh, uh, you know, seems like something we should analyze and, 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 and it's something that comes to bear when, with, with regards to Grayson Rodriguez. So let's say that the Orioles had been just awful last year, just really awful and not at all competitive. Do you think that at, at some point the, the flame is under uh, that management team's but to like start showing something, I think they showed enough last year to buy themselves an extra, like a, a set, a small setback year. I think if they had not exceeded expectations last year and they were bad again this year, there'd be more changes. And I think the other part of this too, changing the ballpark and getting more mileage out of some starters we didn't expect them to get mileage out of, that also affords them a little more patience with Grayson Rodriguez, right? If, if their pitching is a tad better than we expected, if you get something good out of Kyle Bradish, you get Austin Voth to be a useful back-end starter. That enables you to either go to a six-man rotation, to piggyback, to do some types of things that will make Rodriguez a bit less effective from a fantasy perspective than he would be if you just turned him loose and let him go five innings at a time every single time out. I just have a lot of questions about whether or not they're actually going to do that. If we get some sort of confirmation from them that we can believe, maybe I'll jump in at this price. But more likely, I'm going for some ceiling 50 picks later, 100 picks later. We're going to talk a lot about some guys that we like that go later that could do just as well. I as think Austin Rodriguez. both is, is their fifth starter to start the season. And even even beyond that, um, you know, if it's not Austin both, uh, they the, the most recent rumor is that uh, Baltimore is uh, uh, looking still looking for starters. And that yeah. tells you something. So good picture, not an ideal situation.
We are going to go. This is going to wrap up day two of Pitcher Week. If you want to check out day one, it's the episode right before this one. If you're enjoying this podcast on a platform that allows you to leave a rating and review, we'd really appreciate it if you did that. Be sure to hit the like button if you're watching us on YouTube. I should probably say that earlier than the 80th minute of the video. I'm still learning a video like three years in. Uh, be sure Smash to like, that like and- button. Yeah, smash the like button. I know to say that at least. You can find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. You can send questions to rates and barrels at theathletic.com. Pitcher Week continues on Thursday. Thanks for listening.